Hi, I'm Rashonda Cade. This is Reading with Rashonda. We are reading Behind the Scenes by Elizabeth Keckley, and we are on Chapter 6. Chapter 6 is kind of long. Um, we're definitely not going to make it through the whole thing in one reading. Maybe not two. We'll see. But let's get started. Chapter 6, Willie Lincoln's Deathbed. Mrs. Lincoln returned to Washington in November, and again, duty called me to the White House. The war was now in progress, and every day brought stirring news from the front. The front, where the gray opposed the blue, where flashed the bright saber in the sunshine, where were heard the angry notes of battle, the deep roar of cannon, and the fearful rattle of musketry, where new graves were being made every day, where brother forgot a mother's early blessing and sought the lifeblood of brother, and friend raised the deadly knife against friend. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> That's quite a depiction. And literally brothers fought against brothers. Like I that didn't know that was an actual thing, but like literally families fought against each other during the American Civil War. Oh, the front with its stirring battles. Oh, that says scenes. The printing was a little off there. Oh, the front with its stirring battle scenes. Oh, the front with its ghastly heaps of dead. This is horrible just to think about and try to picture in your mind if that's a thing that you do. But oh, the heaps of dead reminded me of the movie Venom <laughs> where he's like piles of bodies, piles of heads. Anyway, that movie cracked me up. All right, back to this. The life of the nation was at stake, and when the land was full of sorrow, there could not be much gaiety at the capital. The days passed quietly with me. I soon learned that some people had an intense desire to penetrate the inner circle of the White House. No president and his family, heretofore occupying this mansion, ever excited so much curiosity as the present, as the present incumbent. Mr. Lincoln had grown up in the wilds of the West, and evil report had said much of him and his wife. The polite world was shocked, and the tendency to exaggerate intensified curiosity. As soon as it was known that I was the modiste of Mrs. Lincoln, parties crowded around and affected friendship for me, hoping to induce me to betray the secrets of the domestic circle. One day a woman, I will not call her a lady, mm, drove up to my rooms, gave me an order to make a dress, and insisted on partly paying me in advance. She called on me every day and was exceedingly kind. When she came to take her dress away, she cautiously remarked, Mrs. Keckley, you know Mrs. Lincoln? Yes. You are her modiste, are you not? Yes. You know her very well, do you not? I am with her every day or two. Don't you think you would have some influence with her? I cannot say. Mrs. Lincoln, I presume, would listen to anything I su should suggest, but whether she would be influenced by a suggestion of mine is another question. I am sure that you could influence her, Mrs. Keckley. Now listen, I have a proposition to make. I have a great desire to become an inmate of the White House. Here the term inmate is not used for somebody who has committed a crime and is incarcerated. This is just a, like somebody who is familiar with a family who is always there in the house. Um, this woman, whoever she is, was playing the long game. Let me get in really good with the modiste and then, ha, try to get in with the, with the first lady. I have a great desire to become an inmate of the White House. I have heard so much of Mr. Lincoln's goodness that I should like to be near him. And if I can enter the White House no other way, I am willing to go as a menial. Mm. My dear Mrs. Keckley, will you not recommend me to Mrs. Lincoln as a friend of yours out of employment and ask her to take me as a chambermaid? If you will do this, you shall be well rewarded. It may be worth several thousand dollars to you in time. I looked at the woman in amazement. A bribe? And to betray the confidence of my employer? Turning to her with a glance of scorn, I said, Madam, you are mistaken in regard to my character. Sooner than betray the trust of a friend, I would throw myself into the Potomac River. I am not so base as that. Pardon me, but there is the door, and I trust that you will never enter my room again. Mm. 
She sprang to her feet in deep confusion and passed through the door murmuring, very well, you will live to regret your action today. So first she tries to bribe her and then she threatens her. Never, never, I exclaimed and closed the door after her with a bang. I afterwards learned that this woman was an actress and that her object was to enter the White House as a servant, learn its secrets, and then publish a scandal to the world. I do not give her name, for such publicity would wound the sensitive feelings of friends who would have to share her disgrace without being responsible for her faults. I simply record the incident to show how I often was approached by unprincipled parties. It is unnecessary to say that I indignantly refused every bribe offered. The first public appearance of Mrs. Lincoln that winter was at the reception on New Year's Day. This reception was shortly followed by a brilliant levy. The day after the levy, I went to the White House, and while fitting a dress to Mrs. Lincoln, she said, Elizabeth, she had learned to drop the E. Elizabeth, I have an idea. These are war times, and we must be as economical as possible. You know the president is expected to give a series of state dinners every winter, and these dinners are very costly. Now, I want to avoid this expense, and my idea is that if I give three large receptions, the state dinners can be scratched from the program. What do you think, Elizabeth? I think that you are right, Mrs. Lincoln. I am glad to hear you say so. If I can make Mr. Lincoln take the same view of the case, I shall not fail to put the idea into practice. Before I left her room that day, Mr. Lincoln came in. She had once stated the case to him. He pondered the question a few moments before answering. Mother, I am afraid your plan will not work. But it will work if you will only determine that it shall work. It is breaking in on the regular custom, he mildly replied. But you forget, Father, these are war times, and old customs can be done away with for the once. The idea is economical, you must admit. Yes, Mother, but we must think of something besides economy. I do think of something else. Public receptions are more democratic than stupid state dinners are more in keeping with the spirit of the institutions of our country, as you would say if called upon to make a stump speech. There are a great many strangers in the city, foreigners and others, whom we can entertain at our receptions, but whom we cannot invite to our dinners. I believe you are right, Mother. You argue the point well. I think that we shall have to decide on the receptions. So the day was carried. The question was decided and arrangements were made for the first reception. It was now January and cards were issued for February. The children, Tad and Willie, were constantly receiving presents. Willie was so delighted with the little, that is just a weird, did I miss a page? I did not miss a page, but it was just weird to me to go from they're issuing cards for the first reception to the children were constantly receiving presents. Obviously, I know there's going to be some sort of connection, but that just, that kind of jarred me a little bit. All right. The children, Tad and Willie, were constantly receiving presents. Willie was so delighted with the little pony that he insisted on riding it every day. Sorry, I had a note on the margin, and I was wondering what I was thinking when I wrote it. I'm back. Sorry about that. The weather was changeable, and exposure resulted in a severe cold, which depended, which deepened into fever. He was very sick, and I was summoned to his bedside. So my note said, they assume you can be a nurse, too. And I was like, why would they assume that? If they're talking about riding the pony. But I got ahead of myself. So she is the modiste of Mrs. Lincoln. And for reasons that I do not understand, other than she is a black woman who can do all things, or at least who can be called upon to do all things, when their kid got sick, he was she was summoned to his bedside. Is she a nurse? Is she a caregiver? Is she a nanny? She's a modiste, a seamstress, which I'm not knocking that, but like if your job is to make clothes, what makes somebody think? That when their kid is sick, they can call you, expect you to come, and be able to do something. That's madness to me. Anyway, he was very sick, and I was summoned to his bedside. 
It was sad to see the poor boy suffer. Always of a delicate constitution, he could not resist the strong inroads of disease. The days dragged wearily by, and he grew weaker and more shadow-like. He was his mother's favorite child, and she doted on him. It grieved her heart sorely to see him suffer. When able to be about, he was almost constantly by her side. When I would go in her room, almost always I found blue-eyed Willie there, reading from an open book or curled up in a chair with pencil and paper in hand. He had decidedly a literary taste and was a studious boy. A short time before his death, he wrote this simple little poem. Washington, D.C., October 30th, 1861. Dear Sir, I enclose you my first attempt at poetry. Yours truly, William W. Lincoln. To the editor of the National Republican. Lines on the death of Colonel Edward Baker. There was no patriot like Baker, so noble and so true. He fell as a soldier on the field, his face to the sky of blue. His voice is silent in the hall, which oft his presence graced. No more he'll hear the loud acclaim, which rang from place to place. No squeamish notions filled his breast, the union was his theme. No surrender and no compromise, his day thought and night's dream. His country has her part to pay towards those he has left behind. His widow and his children all, she must always keep in mind. Um, I know no surrender and no compromise was a rallying cry during the Civil War. I'm assuming it was on the Union side. Because, I mean, this poem says, no squeamish notions filled his breast. The union was his theme. No surrender and no compromise. His day thought and night's dream. Yeah. So that was what, that was the union's rallying cry. We're doing pretty good on time. We've still got like 20 pages left in this chapter. We've been through 10. We'll keep reading. Finding that Willie continued to grow worse, Mrs. Lincoln determined to withdraw her cards of invitation and postpone the reception. And there is the tie. Mr. Lincoln thought the, that the cards had better not be withdrawn. At least he advised that the doctor be consulted before any steps were taken. Please tell me you had previously consulted a doctor. Accordingly, Dr. Stone was called in. He pronounced Willie better and said that there was every reason for an early recovery. As the title of the chapter is about Willie Lincoln's deathbed, I'll assume Willie Lincoln didn't survive. I don't know a whole lot about the Lincolns. I do know they had a son named Tad, and that's the only one I ever knew anything about. But I feel like, of course, Dr. Stone, whoever Dr. Stone was, um, he was obviously a male, and of course he pronounced Willie better and that there was every reason for early recovery because that was what the family wanted to hear. I'm not saying all doctors are like that. I'm, most doctors, I assume, are not. But I'm just saying when the president calls you in and is like, I want my kid to be better so I can have these receptions, depending on your character, as is a big thing for our friend, Mrs. Keckley, your character might just be like, yeah, it's all good. Um, okay. He pronounced Willie better and said that there was every reason for an early recovery. He thought since the invitations had been issued, it would be best to go on with the reception. That he, I am assuming, is Mr. Lincoln. Willie, or maybe the doctor? Willie, he insisted, was in no immediate danger because that he is definitely the doctor. Okay, we're going to go with the doctor. He thought since the invitations had been issued, it would be best to go on with the reception because now the doctor is chiming in on the Lincoln's plan. Perhaps he was being invited to the reception. Mrs. Lincoln was guided by these counsels and no postponement was announced. On the evening of the reception, Willie was suddenly taken worse. His mother sat by his bedside a long while, holding his feverish hand in her own and watching his labored breathing. The doctor claimed there was no cause for alarm. I arranged Mrs. Lincoln's hair, then assisted her to dress. Her dress was white satin trimmed with black lace. 
The trail was very long, and as she swept through the room, Mr. Lincoln was standing with his back to the fire, his hands behind him and his eyes on the carpet. His face wore a thoughtful, solemn look. The rustling of the satin dress attracted his attention. He looked at it a few moments, then in his quaint, quiet way remarked, Whew! Our cat has a long tail tonight. Mrs. Lincoln did not reply. The president added, Mother, it is my opinion if some of that tail was nearer the head, it would be in better style. And he glanced at her bare arms and neck. Ooh. <laughs> President Lincoln lived dangerously talking about his wife's dress. Um, the back is too long and you're too bare up here. Mm. She had a beautiful neck and arm and low dresses were becoming on her. She turned away with a look of offended dignity and presently took the president's arm and both went downstairs to their guests, leaving me alone with the sick boy. The reception was a large and brilliant one, and the rich notes of the marine band in the apartments below came to the sick room in soft, subdued murmurs like the wild, faint sobbing of far-off spirits. Some of the young people had suggested dancing, but Mr. Lincoln met the suggestion with an emphatic veto. The brilliance of the scene could not dispel the sadness that rested upon the face of Mrs. Lincoln. During the evening, she came upstairs several times and stood by the bedside of the suffering boy. She loved him with a mother's heart, and her anxiety was great. The night passed slowly, morning came, and Willie was worse. He lingered a few days and died. God called the beautiful spirit home, and the house of joy was turned into the house of mourning. I was worn out with watching and was not in the room when Willie died, but was immediately sent for. I assisted in washing him and dressing him. This goes so far beyond the scope of being the seamstress for the White House that... You feel bad for taking a break from sitting by the sick bed of their son, and then when he dies, you were immediately sent for so you could wash and dress him? What? This is extreme scope creep. Let me gather myself. I assisted in washing him and dressing him and then laid him on the bed when Mr. Lincoln came in. I never saw a man so bowed down with grief. He came to the bed, lifted the cover from the face of his child, gazed at it long and earnestly, murmuring, My poor boy, he was too good for this earth. God has called him home. I know that he is much better off in heaven, but then we loved him so. It is hard, hard to have him die. Great sobs choked his utterance. He buried his head in his hands, and his tall frame was convulsed with emotion. I stood at the foot of the bed, my eyes full of tears, looking at the man in silent, awe-stricken wonder. His grief unnerved him and made him a weak, passive child. I did not dream that his rugged nature could be so moved. I shall never forget those solemn moments, genius and greatness, weeping over love's idle loss. There is a grandeur as well as a simplicity about the picture that will never fade. With me, it is immortal. I really believe that I shall carry it with me across the dark, mysterious river of death. I think we'll stop there. It is striking to me that we have Lincoln's great grief and sorrow at the death of his son, which that isn't striking any parent. I I cannot begin to imagine what it feels like to lose a child. I just, how do you even go on? So it's not striking that Lincoln demonstrated this level of grief and sorrow. What is striking to me is that enslaved people weren't allowed to do the same thing. Parents and children and siblings would die and would be sold away, spouses as well. And we saw in this book, where your spouse is sold away and you're told, yeah, you want to marry somebody else? There are plenty of people. Like the contrast between being white and being allowed to express all of your human emotion and being black and enslaved and being able to express none. That's really something. I'm reading a book right now 
called Black Buck by Matteo. I cannot think of his last name. Um, but anyway, we're seeing in the in that book Black Buck that I'm reading, and it's not from the 19th century. It's a modern book. The disallowal of being able to express yourself and your emotions as a black person and it's um I don't remember when it was let me look it up I'm about to pull out my phone so I can open up my kindle app and see what I can tell you about this book so my app is open I'm clicking about this book black buck by Matteo Ascarapor, and let's see when it was written. Hmm. Let me, I was looking at the about, let me um, go to the table of contents. Okay, I'm at the title page where there is not a year listed. What is, why is there no year listed here? It's got the, I'm looking for the copyright information. Oh, oh, wait, there we go. 2021, so it was, um, copyrighted in 2021 so a recent book and that's super recent by my my typical reading but anyway so in 2021 a black person not allowed to express their regular human emotions simply for the fact of being black oh come on y'all why is this still happening why anyway that was the first part of chapter six you got me all discombobulated yes that was the first part of chapter six in behind the scenes by elizabeth keckley i'm rashonda cade and this is reading with rashonda <laughs>